everyone, I'm Leslie and my pronouns are they, them. Just sitting at work crying and because my pronoun pens. The homosexual community cannot reproduce in and of themselves. So for them to have a community into the future, they do need your, your children. Hey everybody, I'm Brad Valumbo and welcome back to Damage Control, my new podcast where we are reclaiming the LGBT community from the insane leftists who have taken it over. I'm flying solo today and we're going to tackle a new emerging threat to free speech from within the LGBT movement, woke TikToks, and some right-wing BS that needs calling out from the likes of Matt Walsh and Andrew Tate. If you're new here, settle in, hit that like button, subscribe, comment, yada yada ya, and let's get into it. So up first, I've got to tell you guys about this crazy story I covered for the New York Post this week, where apparently a plurality of millennials now believe that misgendering should be illegal. That's right, a new poll shows just how far support for free speech has fallen, especially among young people. A plurality of millennials thinks misgendering, not using someone's preferred pronouns, should be criminalized, according to a survey Newsweek published Saturday. The Redfield and Wilton Strategies poll finds that 44% of those aged 25 to 34 think, quote, referring to someone by the wrong gender pronoun, he, him, she, her, should be a criminal offense. Just 31% of this demographic disagree, while 25% were undecided. This radical position is more popular than you'd think among those aged 35 to 44, too, with more of those respondents supporting the criminalization of misgendering than opposing it. So overall, we've actually got more millennials who support criminalizing the act of misgendering someone than oppose it. In an interesting twist, though, Gen Z was actually slightly less likely to support this Orwellian censorship. Among those aged 18 to 24, only 33% supported making misgendering a criminal offense, while 48% disagreed. All these groups of young people were much more likely than Americans overall to support the suggested censorship, and the poll found that just 19% of the public overall agrees with making misgendering illegal. So on the Gen Z front, I'm happy that it's not, you know, as much as the millennials, but 33%, one in three Gen Zers, wanting to criminalize speech they find offensive is still a pretty disturbing finding to me. I want to go a little bit into the weeds on this because it really gets at the heart of a tension, an ideological discussion that's gone on for a long time now among younger cohorts, especially those who believe in the social justice movement. And that's this idea that hateful or offensive speech, and that of course is entirely subjective, and in their view applies to a whole lot of speech, ought to be banned. Now, despite what progressives commonly suggest, there is no hate speech exception to the First Amendment. It doesn't exist, it never has, and it never will. The First Amendment does protect offensive speech, even slurs, and there's no reason to think that pronouns are any different. So even if some people find it very offensive to use pronouns to describe a transgender person that aren't their preferred pronouns, it is 100% free speech. It is protected by the First Amendment. And any attempt they ever made to codify the suggestion into law would be struck down by the courts immediately. You simply can't do this. You can't put words in people's mouths and you can't send them to jail for using politically incorrect terminology. But even if you could, you really shouldn't want to. Because once you open the Pandora's box of what speech is offensive and needs to be banned, well, there's no closing it, and you are not always going to be in power. Your political opponents will at some point take power, and then it's your offensive speech that will be on the chopping block or subject to criminalization. Just think of all the Gen Z slang or the words that social justice advocates use that some people, older Americans or conservative Americans, find offensive. There's no better example of this than the word cisgender, which means not transgender. It's what, you know, progressives call people who aren't trans. They say everybody's either cisgender or transgender, but a lot of people reject the label of cisgender. They say, I'm not a cisgender woman, I'm just a woman, and so on. So they find it an offensive term. Should it then be banned? Now, I would say, of course not, because I don't believe in any of this, but under their logic, that offensive speech that undermines someone's gender identity must be banned, 
Well, that would apply to the term cisgender that they put in every woke gender guide around. It would also apply to Gen Z's humor and slang. Everything from OK Boomer to Karen and other, you know, terms and slang they use that some people find offensive. I've seen many older Americans say that OK Boomer is offensive to them or ageist. Similarly, I've seen some white women say that they think Karen is an offensive term. It's stereotyping. Now, in both cases, I think they're being a little snowflakey and should just take the joke. But again, if we're going with Gen Z and millennials logic here, or at least some of them, well, those terms could be banned too. So if you want the cops to start cracking down on pronouns, don't be surprised when they come for your memes next. The final point I'll make on this bizarre and Orwellian story is that if your ultimate goal is to get transgender people accepted or to have people use their preferred pronouns, this is not the right way to do it. Americans have always had a kind of libertarian streak to them, and they really don't like being told what to do. So to try to coerce them into using pronouns is probably going to backfire and make them dig their heels in, whereas before this became a, so aggressive, before it became such a toxic issue, a lot of people would have probably just done it and got along to be polite. Whereas now, when you're trying to threaten them with cultural or political power and say you must bend the knee, well, people are going to be obstinate and they're going to say, no, we will not use your preferred pronouns. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. And if people wanted to try to increase trans acceptance or get pronoun usage to be more widely accepted, you should do that in a way that is nonchalant, that is not aggressive, that is just, you know, being kind to people and asking them to reciprocate. And that isn't calling anyone a bigot or trying to criminalize their speech. That's only going to engender backlash, as anybody with basic foresight could have told you. But unfortunately, a clear slice of young people today lack the basic foresight to understand why criminalizing offensive speech is such a bad idea and almost guaranteed to backfire. So maybe just don't try it. Maybe just don't. All right, guys, shield your eyes because it's time to react to some woke TikToks. And up first, we've got an interesting twist, something I don't encounter very often, and that is a woke Christian. Just sitting at work crying and because my pronoun pins made somebody feel uncomfortable that they would have to tell somebody their gender and somebody wouldn't just assume it. And then I had to defend myself and my faith because how could I be a Christian and sell pronoun pens? <laughs> and I explained that the pronoun pens like she, she her it's not because somebody might not know that you are she her but that you um see the person and you believe in the person i said i sell pronoun pins so that person who identifies as she her but not may not feel safe in the dressing room because they were born with a penis knows that i see them and they are safe here it's not about you it's about them okay so for folks who are just listening, this woman is literally crying. She's like practically bawling while making this video. And that's my first issue. I don't really care if she wants to sell silly pronoun pins. I certainly wouldn't wear one, but uh, whatever. But you lack the basic emotional resilience and functioning of an adult. If somebody simply questioning you about why you're selling a particular item puts you into literal tears, a literal emotional breakdown that you post on the internet. Which, by the way, is a weird trend. Like, maybe you should talk to your therapist about this instead of TikTok. But for a grown adult to be reduced to tears over something like this, to me, just shows how infantilizing and how fragile people in this movement can be. You're an advocate for a certain movement and a certain set of ideas, and yet you literally emotionally combust if somebody asks you to defend them or explain them. Since when is it a crime to ask somebody why they believe the things they believe or why they have a certain belief in accordance with their faith or not? Unless there's more to the story we don't know and they were somehow physically threatened or something, this level of emotional hysteria and reaction is just crazy. 
And I'll say, as far as the pronoun pins being meant to assuage the feelings or worries of somebody who identifies as a she, her, but has a penis, I don't get it. From my conversations with legitimate transsexual people, they want to pass as the other gender to the point where they don't need a pronoun pin. And also, I don't know what dressing rooms are like at her store, but I always thought they were solo stalls, right? And shouldn't really matter. Plus, I really just don't buy the idea that most trans people are so emotionally fragile they need everyone around them to wear pronoun pins or they'll somehow feel unwelcome or unsafe. I think most of them are functioning adults and will be just fine, actually. The shop owner, on the other hand... <laughs> Up next, we've got a clip from Charles Barkley that went viral on TikTok. Take a look. I got three kisses of Bud Light. Hey, and I want to say this. If you're gay, bless you. If you're transgender, bless you. And if you have a problem with that, you. Wow. What a stunning and brave statement, Charles. Look, I like Charles Barkley on some things. He makes some good points sometimes, but this is just kind of cringe. I don't really care about the whole Bud Light boycott fiasco one way or another. I really don't have strong feelings on it. But I will say that to say, you know, bless you if you're gay or trans, that's great. Yeah, I'm glad you're being welcoming. But then to castigate anyone who has a problem with it and tell them to F off, it's just... I mean, that's not how you reach people. You don't reach out to somebody with a closed fist. You reach out to them with an open hand and try to make them understand that gay and trans people, for the most part, are just like anyone else. They're your neighbors. They're normal people. They've got jobs. They've got families. They have American values. And so you shouldn't hate them. You shouldn't discriminate against them. And if you do, uh, hopefully we can help you understand why that's not the right path. You're not going to convince or convert anyone by cussing them out or telling them they're a terrible person. And I will say, Charles Barkley is a straight ally, and it constantly seems to me like they're the ones doing the most damage, the most harm. They're the ones out here with the most performative cringe activism that's actually turning people off and hurting the movement, but hey, they get to virtue signal and get applause and show what a good ally they are. I actually think it's incredibly selfish, and they're simply cashing in on woke social currency and they don't really care if they're actually helping acceptance or not. So I'm just asking allies like Charles Barkley to please just shut up. Just stop talking about this. You're not helping. Up next, we've got a TikTok of somebody pushing non-binary pronouns to young children through ventriloquy. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie, and my pronouns are they, them. And I'm Ray. My pronouns are also they, them. And what are we celebrating this week, Ray? It is Non-Binary Awareness Week. And what does that mean? Well, that means if you don't feel like a boy in your heart, or a girl in your heart, or if you feel like neither, or both, you are seen, you are loved, and you are supported no matter what. That's right. We love you for who you are, no matter what you might look like on the outside. We know who you are on the inside. And to all of our friends who might not be non-binary, how can we help them support our non-binary friends? Well, you can always make sure you're using the right pronouns because you want to respect your friends. Well, what if somebody accidentally calls me the wrong pronoun and you are with me? What would you do? Oh, I would simply say, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I see that you said she, but Leslie goes by they. That simple. That respectful. That is love. That is what being non-binary is about. We love you. We see you. Mwah! <laughs> Anyone else just feel creeped out by that? Also, that was the worst ventriloquy I've ever seen. When you have one of the puppets like that, you're not supposed to move your lips. That's the whole point of the ventriloquy is that, but for folks who are just listening, she's literally just moving her mouth like normal while moving the puppet. It's just terrible ventriloquy. At least get commit to the bit. If you're gonna do it, commit to the bit. Look, uh, this says that she's a preschool teacher, and obviously the ventriloquy with the big puppet is aimed at very young children, 
And I just think it, it's really unnecessary and weird to be introducing these strange gender concepts to such young children. Non-binary as a concept doesn't even make sense to most adults. What does it mean to feel like a boy or feel like a girl or not feel like a boy or not feel like a girl? They've never been able to explain that to me without using gender stereotypes that really have nothing to do with your sex. So if so many adults don't even understand or accept this, how is a four-year-old supposed to? You're just going to confuse kids and it's just not age appropriate and it's really going to turn people off and cause a lot of backlash to the LGBT community overall. Because a lot of good Americans who aren't bigots are going to find shit like this creepy and weird and want nothing to do with it. And the more you associate it with the LGBT community, the more harm you do to our actual acceptance and our actual rights. If you're an adult and you want to tell the world you're non-binary, I'm not certainly not going to try to stop you. But please don't go confusing children who will never have heard of any of this. And they're so impressionable. The next week you might have three of them come out as non-binary. I mean, it's just obvious that four-year-olds are five-year-olds, whatever are very impressionable and just putting these concepts in their mind is not going to go well. And for the rare youth that truly are gender dysphoric, they don't need it suggested. They know from a very young age that they feel trapped in the wrong body and nobody ever had to educate them about it or inform them about it. It's just an intrinsic rare mental condition that they've experienced since as long as they can remember in many cases. So you're not actually helping the transgender youth you think you're helping. You're just confusing young kids, alienating the public, and sabotaging LGBT acceptance. Other than that, great work. This next video isn't a TikTok, but it's one of the most demented things I've ever seen. The first trans woman to have a successful uterus transplant, ovaries and eggs included. And I want to be the first trans woman to have an abortion. I will let a doctor who has successfully transplanted a uterine complex before cut the organs out of a willing, healthy, transmasculine donor, place them in my body. I will devote myself, heart and soul, to their aftercare. I will have as much gay sex as it takes with as many trans women as it takes and let the transphobes and homophobes scratch their heads, wondering what to make of it. And I want to be the first trans woman to have an abortion. This is so demented, I really don't know where to begin. Y'all know I'm fine with trans adults living their life and getting sex treatments and reassignment surgeries and all that, and I'll even use their preferred pronouns. I also have good friends and family members who are on either side of the abortion debate, pro-choice and pro-life, and I don't weigh into it a lot even though I lean more on the pro-life side because I think it's really complicated and there are emotionally fraught and compelling arguments on either side. I can understand why some women feel the need to preserve that as a last option, but one thing I can never understand is the weird people who celebrate abortion like it's some sort of fun or cute thing. Ultimately, you're talking about ending a human life, or at the very least, preventing one that would have become into existence, and you're acting like that's a cute aspect of womanhood you just can't wait to indulge in to trigger conservatives when you find yourself this far gone this taking this kind of extreme rhetoric or position just to thumb your nose at the other side that's a good sign that you've fallen into the grips of reverse polarization and tribalism and that you're no longer actually thinking for yourself or doing what's right but you're simply doing whatever you think will piss off the people you hate the most it's not a logical or moral way to go through life. And crazy stuff like this not only hurts the trans cause, but it also hurts the pro-choice cause, if that's something you support. And I, I want to be clear about the fact that basically every transsexual person I know would think that what I just showed you is crazy and would totally disavow it. These extreme people aren't actually representative of the trans community or the LGBT community at all, 
but they seem to put themselves out there and really go viral with these takes. So it's important to point that out, that their craziness is just, it's not, please don't put it all on us. We do not endorse this. All right. For my last woke TikTok, I've got to react to this because it gets into one of the funniest paradoxes I see in left-wing thought. Take a listen. It is not marginalized people's responsibility to teach you how to treat us like human beings. Weaponizing competence is a mighty tool and it needs to be set down. You have the information at your fingertips. The person who has the privilege is the person who needs to be making the expense of time, of energy, emotional labor, resources, whatever it is. There is no excuse. And even if you're marginalized, you still need to examine all of those other layers, like an onion. Make sure that you are protecting the people in your community that are more marginalized than you and who are affected by this system in ways that you aren't. We all have a collective responsibility to each other. And part of that is taking accountability and ownership for our own learning and not forcing it onto other people. I'm so glad that the uh, mainstream LGBT community threw me out a long time ago and I'm not trying to be in their good graces because my God, it must be exhausting trying to keep up. So folks like this simultaneously say that minor verbal tics are microaggressions that cause harm to marginalized people, but that also it's not their responsibility to educate you or explain to you what exactly is offensive or you're, you are or not allowed to do. So even a well-meaning ally is left to essentially guess and try to figure it out on their own. And if they get something wrong, they'll be canceled. But also it's not on, on these people to explain what they actually want and how they want to be treated. It really seems to me you can't have it both ways, at least if you're a serious person or want people to take your demands seriously. But that, of course, doesn't apply to this particular woke TikToker nor to most of the community pushing this kind of thing in the first place. They would be so much more compelling if they just said, hey, everyone makes mistakes sometimes, but I actually go by this instead of that. I just It would mean a lot to me if you would respect that and call me that. But instead, they'll attack you as a bigot, they'll try to cancel you, they'll complain to your boss or whatever, and then they'll try to get mad at you for something they also didn't even tell you because it's not my job to educate you. Also, anytime I hear these people talking about privilege, I just roll my eyes because the true reality of life and who's privileged and who's not is so complicated and has so many layers, but these people always just reduce it to one or two boxes on the census. Is Are they white? Are they not? Are they male? Are they not? And then act as if you can therefore determine whether someone's a privileged person or not in life when it's just so much more complicated than that. Hard pass to all of this. It's cringe. It's just, ugh, ugh, no, no thank you. All right, now it's time to check in on my pals over at the Daily Wire. This time, Matt Walsh, who is praising the Russian government because of the new steps they took to limit transgender adults' rights. Take a look at this clip from his show. Speaking of Russia, here's some great news out of Russia. Of course, Russia gets a bad rap, but uh, the fact is that they get plenty right. And, and we hear that, oh, you know, Russia doesn't value freedom and democracy like we just talked about. What, like, like we do? Yeah, we know Ukraine doesn't. I mean, we live in a country that can, where you can be branded a domestic terrorist if you go to a school board meeting. We live in a country where pro-lifers are pulled out of their homes by federal agents at the crack of dawn because they, they protested outside of an abortion clinic. Like, that's what happens in our country. So what exactly do we know about freedom here? That's a question maybe we should ask ourselves. But in any case, here's uh, Russia's latest alleged sin. This is from CNN. The Russian state Duma, or lower house of par parliament, has voted in favor of a new law banning nearly all medical help for transgender people, including gender reassignment surgery, in a raft of new anti-LGBTQ laws in Russia. The bill, which had its third and final reading on Friday, prohibits doctors from conducting gender reassignment surgeries, except in cases related to treating congenital physiological anomalies in children. It also restricts registry offices from amending official documents based on medical certificates of gender change. The law must still be approved by the Federation Council and signed by President Vladimir Putin before it comes into force. Amendments made, it, made for its uh, third reading included uh, disqualifying individuals who have undergone gender changes from becoming adoptive parents or guardians, as well as the possibility of annulling a marriage if one or both spouses undergo a gender change and update their civil status records. Now, I mean, this is all great stuff. Of course, the claim that Russia has banned nearly all medical help for trans people is, uh, is false. That's not what the article describes. Uh, it's not as if trans people are not allowed to get like heart surgery or something. Um, 
what they have banned or are trying to ban is sexual mutilation of people of all ages, which is exactly the correct thing to do. I don't know about you guys, but I'm old enough to remember when conservatives were patriots who loved America and who didn't basically say that paint a false moral equivalency between Russia and America. Oh, Russia has a bad rap. Yeah, maybe because it's an authoritarian country. This wishy-washy bullshit, this false equivalency conflates the U.S., which, yeah, we certainly have our problems, but it conflates us with an oligarchical authoritarian regime that slaughters innocents, that assassinates its political opponents, that suppresses minority religions and religious freedom, and that suppresses speech and only allows state-run media. So Russia gets a bad rap for a reason, Matt. Now, as far as them banning transition care for adults, this is not something any conservative that believes in freedom, medical freedom, or bodily autonomy should get behind. Freedom can never be a one-way street, and these same folks, the Matt Walshes of the world, were rightly raising hell during COVID about their right to bodily autonomy and medical freedom, not wanting to be forced to take things they don't want to take or wear masks they don't want to wear, and all of that, you know, I largely agreed with them. But now, when it comes to trans issues, they flip the script, and now they're the ones who think that their views on medicine or their preferences should be imposed on others, even if they want to do something between them and their doctor that's different. There's a word for that. It's called hypocrisy. I, for one, think people own their bodies, and they should be free to pursue whatever treatments will make them happy. And yes, for adults who've had persistent gender dysphoria for a long time, sometimes living as the opposite gender, and including medical transition treatments, is what makes them happiest, is what alleviates their dysphoria, what is what improves their mental health. And it's not for me or you to decide what's right for other people. And I don't want other people deciding what's right for me and what I can do in my own life with my own body, so I have to give others that same respect and right. But folks like Matt Walsh are just so consumed with obsession about trans adults and ideology that they don't see this inconsistency. On another key point, I want to point out that this you can only do things that I approve of mentality is not going to work out for fringe religious people like Matt Walsh. I fully support his right to live his life and raise his family how he sees fit, but newsflash, most of this country probably disagrees with a lot of his beliefs and a lot of the ways in which he wants to organize and run his life. We're going to start playing a game where the state gets to decide matters of your personal business and your body. It's not going to go well for minority viewpoints of which extreme traditionalists are certainly one and increasingly so. You also discredit the legitimate concerns and case to be made that minors can't consent or fully understand these treatments when you lump it in with blanket opposing rights and freedoms of all transgender people, including adults. The nuanced correct position here is that adults should be free to live their lives how they want and do what they want with their body, but that we should have reasonable protections and safeguards for minors who can't fully understand and consent. But the Matt Walshes of the world want to go full Leroy Jenkins and throw out basic principles of individual liberty, medical autonomy, and everything they've said they believed on every other issue just because they're so obsessed with this one side of the culture war. Count me out. Finally, guys, I have to talk about Andrew Tate. I'm not going to get into his whole shtick, but if you don't know who he is, he's a mega influencer, red pill, self-described alpha male influencer who is one of the most famous or infamous people on the internet. He recently sat down for a lengthy interview with Tucker Carlson, which I mentioned on the other podcast I do. I covered it there, the Based Politics podcast with my Based co-founder, Hannah Cox. So please go check it out if you want to hear our full take on the interview and the criminal allegations against Tate. However, in one portion of the interview, Tate wandered into territory that can really only be described as homophobic, and I want to address the anti-gay portion of the interview. So take a listen to what he had to say. This is a video from a recent Pride March in New York, and I'm interested in your view of it. So I have a few points on this. The first point is that it is an unfortunate reality, and I'm not going to be called a bigot. I'm going to talk about the reality that the homosexual community cannot reproduce in and of themselves. 
So for them to have a community into the future, they do need your, your children. That's how they think. For there to be a homosexual community in 100 years from now, they need straight people's kids. Because only straight people have children. So they're very, they're telling the truth. That's the first thing. They, they mean what they say. The second thing is, I think a lot of this is an attention grab by them. I think they are slightly disappointed in how tolerant many people actually are. I have no problem with gay people, I don't care. I'm gay, cool. I wanna get married, fine. I'm gonna wave my dick in your kid's face. Wait a second. <laughs> yeah. They, they push it to a point where we have to react. And then when we react, they say we're bigoted. So there's so much to unpack there. Uh, look, I appreciate that Tate says he's fine with gay people and gay marriage. And I will take him at his word on that. But what he said about gay people and kids is just totally off base. First off, the idea that only straight people reproduce isn't really accurate. In fact, in particular, a lot of lesbian couples can reproduce through a sperm donor. And then some gay couples uh, reproduce through a surrogate, but of course, an adoption. But that's all kind of a tangent. It's a rabbit hole. But what he said isn't isn't true. The the main thrust of Tate's comments here that the gay community needs to recruit children. Uh, and I know they played that one terrible video from a New York City Pride Parade, but I already roasted that. And that's not representative whatsoever of the gay community at large. Um, what he said there doesn't make any sense. First off, as a gay person, I've never thought or been concerned about ensuring there are gay people a hundred years from now or reproducing as a community or anything like that any more than I've worried that there won't be any people with brown hair in a hundred years. Sexuality is a natural human variation. It just exists organically. It's not something produced or that has to be managed and passed along through the generations. I didn't know any gay people growing up. I had only maybe the most minor exposure to a few minor characters on TV that were gay or something. I had straight parents, straight step parents, and I turned out gay. That's always what happens. So gay people don't need to groom or recruit children to join the community. Literally just future generations of people, there will be some who are born gay or lesbian. That's just how this works. So to use such a faulty explanation to assign this nefarious motive or scheme to the gay community is really unfair. And really it is, whether it's intentional or not, it's bigoted. I also have to call out Tucker Carlson here because when he wants to be, he can be a fantastic interviewer. We just saw him with Mike Pence and other GOP politicians really exposing them and pulling out receipts and he has that in him but in this interview he didn't point out any of these basic factual errors or inconsistencies in Tate's statements he just nodded along like a lap dog that's not journalism it's sycophancy I found this portion of the interview really gross and disappointing I just wish that when people have massive influence they were more careful about the things they said because you can do a lot of harm when you spread false ideas and false information about communities that have been historically stereotyped or reviled. So please, folks, for so many reasons, don't go to Andrew Tate for your wisdom on societal or political trends. All right, guys, that's it for this episode of Damage Control. I'm Brad Palumbo. Thanks so much for watching. If you're new here, be sure that you like, comment, subscribe on YouTube, yada, yada, yada. If you're listening to my beautiful voice right now on Apple or Spotify, take a second out of your day, just a second, I would really appreciate it, and leave me a glowing five-star review so more people can discover this very needed podcast to restore sanity to the LGBT community. And with that, I'll see you all next week.